I'm Jimmy Neidhart, and it's my honor to read you God's word from Matthew 2, 1 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard from the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and st until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in the dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jimmy, for that reading of God's Word. Glad you decided to join us today. My name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. I also want to welcome our church at home gatherings that are joining us as well for week two of our Advent series, The Hope. This week, we're going to be looking at a message titled, Hope Despite Tears. Let's just address the elephant in the room right at the beginning regarding the passage that we just heard about. Specifically, Herod's reaction in verses 16 to 18, where he ordered the killing of those little boys. This is not your standard classic Christmas passage, but it is part of the narrative of Jesus Christ. And so it is worth our consideration today. As we move forward, let me give you a little bit of background for what's going on here in this story. In the year 40 B.C., Rome appointed Herod the Great to, to be a ruler and to reign in Judea. Now, Herod was not of Jewish heritage, but they did appoint him to rule in the region of Judea, which at that time was most of Palestine. And Herod, he was an amazing builder. He built great architectural structures. He is uh, known for building these things. That's how he got the name Herod the Great. And one of his most well-known uh, projects that he oversaw was the renovation of the temple in Jerusalem. He was an amazing builder, but he was also a vicious leader. Herod was, was a very paranoid man, and that only grew worse the older that he got. He was so paranoid that he actually ended up killing several of his sons and his wife. So when we read that the wise men didn't return 
back to him to tell him where Jesus was and, and that he ordered the killing of those little boys in Bethlehem and in that region, that was very in character for him. Other than those who were directly impacted by that event, other than those people, this would not have been considered a notable event in a reign characterized by brutality. Yet this horrible thing and the sadness that surrounds it is part of the the story of Jesus Christ. And the question that undoubtedly echoed in the home of every father and mother on that Christmas morning is why? Why? It's a question that anyone who has suffered significant loss and grief has asked at one time or another. The question, why? For every grieving person who looks at the holidays simply as, as, a, as a season to survive through, for every person like that, that question rises up once again. Why? I'm sure you know people where, for them, the holidays are not viewed as such a joyful time because of a loss that they've experienced, whether it's a new loss or a lingering grief. I'm certain that describes some of you out there. Whether it's your first Christmas or your 20th Christmas without that spouse or that child or that father or mother or that dear friend, The holidays for you are a reminder of an absence. Maybe for you, Christmas highlights your loneliness or or depression that you're going through. And you're living in a disillusioned state rather than this ideal picturesque time that, that you longed for. And so for you, the holidays are a time of grief or struggle or or questioning. Just like so many of those families. 2,000 years ago, on that day that Herod ordered the execution of those boys. And the fact that God includes death as part of the Christmas story, it makes a very powerful point. And that leads us into our big idea for today, which is this. An evil world delivers death. Our gracious God offers life. The death of the innocence reveals not the kind of God that we have, but the kind of world that we live in. We live in a fallen world that promotes evil. But our God, who laid aside his privileges that he had in heaven to come to earth to be born as a baby in Bethlehem, reveals the kind of God that we have. And he's a good God. And this morning, we're going to look at two truths that address both sides of our big idea. And after looking at these truths, we're going to have a deeper understanding about how we can have hope despite tears. Our two truths are these. The first one is we live in an unjust world. And our second truth is we serve a life-giving God. So let's take a look at our first truth. We live in an unjust world. I am certain that is no surprise to you. At one time or another, we have all been victims from living in an unjust world. Everything that comes at us, from warts to wars, stems from the fallen state of our world. In fact, Romans 8.22, it tells us about the state of our world. Here's what it says. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation is groaning because of its cursed state. Now, the natural question to ask here is, isn't it God who cursed the earth? And the answer to that is yes. And he had good reason to. Genesis 2 sets up the scene for us. Here's what it says starting in Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man... And put him in the Garden of Eden 
to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, this was the ideal situation. This was a time when man was in perfect fellowship with God. There was peace and there was harmony on the earth. And the passage here tells us that in the center of that garden, there were two amazing trees. There was the tree of life. And and that particular tree, when someone would eat from that tree, they would live forever. And this is the same tree that appears in Revelation 22 when the new earth is described. The, The new earth is a time when God restores the earth to its original condition, its original uncursed condition, and when God's people live with him on that earth. And God's design was for human beings to live forever, sustained by the tree of life. And the new earth will be the restoration of Eden, and the tree of life will be on the new earth. So that's the first tree. The second tree that was there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge here is speaking of more than just an awareness. It's an intimate acquaintance, and it's an experiential acquaintance with both good and evil. It emphasizes application and the practice of both. Now, up to this point, Adam and Eve had only experienced good. And for whatever reason, we're not told why, for whatever reason, God put these trees close to each other in the center of that garden. But in that garden, there was someone else. There was Satan, the adversary of God. And he came into the garden, and he tempted Adam and Eve, and he tricked them into disobeying God and eating from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they did. They disobeyed God. And because they disobeyed God and ate from that tree, God intervened in order to prevent them from living forever in that sinful state. Genesis 3, 22, 23 says this, and this is, this is God speaking about Adam. It says this, He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. God drove them out of the Garden of Eden to prevent them from eating from the tree of life. Why? Because think about this. If Adam and Eve had eaten from that tree of life, they would have lived forever in that sinful state. And then they would have had children, and their children would have followed in their footsteps, and they would have lived forever in that sinful state. And mankind would have been ever populating, never dying, continually going on, living in that sinful state, separated from God for eternity. Think about what the world would look like today if that was if that was allowed to happen. People would have had millennia to build up their evil empires. There would have been unprecedented oppression of other people while evil leaders would go unchecked and they would muddle on into their hopeless eternity. It would be a literal hell on earth. And God stepped in because he knew the outcome of this. And in his love, he would not allow it. That's why he stepped in and he determined that death was going to be the fate of each and every person. And through that death, it would break that cycle of hopelessness. And through Jesus Christ, we could have the opportunity to live with him forever in eternity. Followers of Jesus will one day eat from that tree of life when we are with God in eternity. But until that point, we're still going to have struggles. We're still going to have pain. And the purpose of those struggles and that pain is to draw us back to God. The world is an unfair place because the world is a fallen place. But that fallenness forms the context for God's plan to save us from an eternity where we would be separated from him. That's why Jesus humbled himself and came to earth. That's why we celebrate Christmas. 
Jesus Christ, he is the only one that offers hope beyond our present world. An evil world delivers death. Our gracious God offers life. Let's take a look at our second truth. It's this. We serve a life-giving God. God is not sitting by passively as the world seems to, to fall apart. He is actively involved in our world. God is unfolding his plan as he prepares you for eternity. God is constantly making followers of Christ more like Jesus. And that process is going to continue on and on until Christ returns for his people and gives them glorified bodies. Here's what Philippians 1, 6 says. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Now, I often hear people say that, that they wish that Jesus would return right now. And looking at the state of the world, that does make sense. But consider this. Consider that God is taking his time to give more time to your children, your parents, your neighbors, your friends, to you, to turn to him and trust him as your savior. Second Peter 3, 9 says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Even though it seems like he's taking a long time, be assured that the outcome that the battle with evil is a certain outcome, and God wins. God is sovereign over everything, and he not only knows the end from the beginning, he ordains the end from the beginning, and he is going to see it through. Even in our passage for today that we read, in, in the passage where it talks about that tragedy in Bethlehem, that is a confirmation of the hope that we have in God. Here's a part of that passage once again. It says, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, Ramah is a city within the region of Bethlehem, and Rachel, Jacob's wife, is buried there. And this passage, this passage is a fulfillment of that prophecy given hundreds of years before in Jeremiah 31.15. God saw it through. So when God says we can hope in him because he will see it through, he really does see it through. Now, there are large, large numbers of other prophecies throughout the Bible that we can have that, that give us hope. Jesus himself, there are over 300 fulfilled prophecies about Jesus alone that can give us hope. The Bible is full of reasons to hope. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us this. It tells us of the absolute assurance uh, that our future holds and that Jesus wins. Here's what it says. Then the end will come when Jesus hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. As, as followers of Christ... We serve a life-giving, victorious God, and that's why we can have absolute hope in the future. The hope that we have is, is not merely wishful thinking, though. The, the hope that we have is built upon the blood-bought promise of Jesus Christ that he will make all things better for all who trust in him and follow him. Revelation 21.4 tells this. This is a great, this is a great verse says this, he will wipe away, this is speaking of Jesus to his followers, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What a great verse. That, and that is not a fairy tale. That, that is the reality for the future of all believers. That is why Jesus came 2,000 years ago to be born as a baby in a manger, to put on human flesh, and to live in a fallen world that would ultimately kill and crucify him. It's part of his plan all along because he loves you. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus. Jesus 
loves you. Now, there are many of you going into the holiday seasons with grief. And I don't want to let you know, it is okay to grieve during the holiday season. Give yourself permission to miss that important person in your life. Give yourself permission to maybe even put aside some of the traditions that you used to, used to experience and do together. Even if you've figured out over the years how to navigate holiday time a little bit better. The excitement just may not be there as it once was. And we have emotions that we're allowed to use. God gave us emotions. And we can use them. So use them. God even included them in the events surrounding the birth of his son. It's okay to grieve. But. We are told in Scripture, do not sorrow like those without hope. See, we're to be conscious of the loss, but we're not to be consumed by it. God wants us to balance out those feelings by focusing on the reason for Christmas in the first place, the hope that is promised you in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us this in Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared and offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we, get this, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all, unwicked, from all wickedness. The word of Blessed there means happy. We can have a happy hope for the future, not because our hope is based on the economy or on our health or, or on our retirement plan, because those are not solid foundations. We can only have a happy hope when our focus and our faith is placed in the proper place. When we focus our hope on Jesus Christ, we're reminded of the love and the forgiveness and the mercy of God. And we will be able to more easily begin to look at that holiday season with a little more joy and anticipation. When we take the focus off of our loss and we focus our hope on Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us, we'll be able to look at the holiday seasons with a little bit more joy. Life can be hard. Absolutely. No one, no one says it's not hard. The absence of a loved one, it may stir up emotions. Sadness may come from memories that you have during this time of year. And during these conflicted emotion times, it's easy to ask the question whether or not God really cares. But it's in times like that, in the midst of all of that, it's more important than ever to remember that mercy himself, Jesus Christ our Lord, came to earth. He was born in a stable. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on a cross for you. And one day, sooner than we realize, we're going to be standing face to face with Jesus. And we're going to look at his hands, and we're going to see those nail-scarred hands. And we're going to realize that that was done for us. And we will understand that our hope was placed in the one who conquers all. Although the world itself produces death, God, who emptied himself to be born in Bethlehem, is greater, and he's good, and he's life-giving. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you, God. You are our hope. Father, you sent your son Jesus to come to earth to be, to be born as a baby, to live a, a sinless life, to be crucified on a cross, God, in our place, taking the punishment we deserve. And he was raised again and is in heaven right now. God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you during this holiday season. There are many people out there who have grief and loss. God, help them to 
transition their eyes off of that grief and loss during this holiday season and to look at you, the real reason for the holidays, the real reason for Christmas. Help them to look to you as the only source of their hope. We pray this, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. Before you go, I have some quick updates for you. So our Christmas Eve service times will be right up here in this corner, and we're going to have seven services in total. And registration for that is going to go live on December 18th at noon, so be sure to snag a ticket for you and your loved ones. And if you would like to help us on Thursday nights at our recording, join our media team. And for that, um, for more information about that, please email me at the email provided below. And for any more updates and things that are going on here at Grace, please check out our bulletin and graceforfamilies.com. Have a blessed weekend.